It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us to talk about business as a force for good is the speaker at the upcoming Service Omnium Lecture, which is going to be Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, February 25th, 7 a.m. Dr. Carolyn Wu, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. So I think most people by now know who you are. You were working with CRS for many years, and I think a lot of times when we think of businesses, we don't necessarily think of them as a force for good. And a lot of times we have like this idea of evil corporations. How have you seen businesses doing good things uh, with your work with CRS to start with? Absolutely, Kyle. But first, let me just backtrack. I was CEO of Catholic Relief Services, which is a development humanitarian agency. We serve very poor people. But before then, I was the dean of the business school at Notre Dame. So mm-hmm. I've been involved in business, and I've served on a lot of business boards. And even my work with CRS and afterwards is really the collaboration between business and development needs. So business as a force for good, there are three things. One is that business has a bad reputation, and I would say deservedly so. There are many scandals of how business really behaves inappropriately, uh, took advantage of other people, and we could name those. And actually, this also stems from a culture where there is a lot of cheating, actually, Hmm. So it is, uh, in some ways, a manifestation of the lesser good part of us. However, it's wrong thinking, it's wrong-minded thinking to think of business as a necessary evil. Business is actually a necessary good. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that business has to accomplish. In fact, our life as a society and our human flourishing is not possible if there is no business. So I could go into a lot of that and actually the various popes have encyclicals on this, uh, starting with Pope Leo, Pope John Paul II II, Pope Benedict, and even Pope Francis. While they put a lot of uh, boundaries on, you know, what businesses need to do, what their priorities need to be, they all acknowledge that business is actually necessary for human flourishing. It's just that it's also open to a lot of misbehavior, but that it is a necessary good, and we need to be aware of why that is so. The third and final part of this is, in the end, it depends on the ethical energies, the ethical commitment of individuals. You know, business is a collection of people, and leadership at all levels really matters. And so on an individual level, and particularly as Catholics and Christians, what are we called to do? in terms of providing that ethical leadership. So those are my three parts. So going back to your time as the dean at Notre Dame's Mendoza College of Business, what were some of your goals with educating future business workers and business leaders? Yeah, absolutely. So the business school at Notre Dame, first of all, was founded by a cardinal, Cardinal O'Hara. And from the very beginning, when he started the business school, it was business is to be a force for good Mm -hmm. uh, for mankind. So that's the foundation. And so the whole idea is to recognize how business on a macro level is very important to society. And secondly, how we as individuals make that vision come true. And so we always say business as a force for good is our mission and that we should ask more of business and ask more of ourselves. So, and our students would tell you that, that that is sort of what they internalized, is to ask more so that we could do more good. And the way you embed that in the curriculum, so actually ethics is in every one of the MBA courses, in one way or another. It is not just sectioned off into some course called business ethics. We do have those but that it is also embedded in every business course. There are over 70-some of these electives and marketing courses and finance courses, recognizing their ethics role to everything we do and embedded in many decisions. So I think that's why Notre Dame is unique. And in fact, several times it was recognized as the leader in ethical education. So first of all, it's accepting 
that responsibility. Secondly, is understanding the impact of that, the incredible force that if we achieve that mission, what we can do to serve others. And third, then, is uh, helping students understand how ethics is integrated into all of these decisions. And, um, and of course, the fourth thing is how do you have the courage to act on that? Because when we don't do the right things, it's not because we don't know good from evil. Hmm. It's not, well, couldn't tell whether cheating is really a good thing or a bad thing. So we do know what is the right thing to do. We just don't do it. And in lies, actually, the opportunity for formation. Why is it that we don't have enough courage to do what we know is right, and particularly in this society? Do you have an answer to that question? Why, why don't we do the right thing when it's right in front of us? Absolutely. Actually, there's a lot of research on that. Why? What is the breaking point? from knowing what is good to doing what is good. So, first of all, when you know something is not right, there's actually a lot of rationalization. If you don't have the courage to do that, there's a lot of social and personal rationalization, like, oh, this is not a great thing to do, but everybody does it. When in Rome, just live like the Romans. Or another thing is to say, well, this is not my pay grade. People before me have approved this. People after me will approve this. And so who am I to really break this chain? And that's a question of actually of agency. This is not my pay grade. Mm-hmm. There's a third realization, which is the means may be wrong, but the ends are good. If I done this, I get a better grade. I don't disappoint my parents and they work so hard for me. Or well, we are just fudging these numbers a little bit. That way the company doesn't get into trouble and all of my colleagues get to keep their jobs. So this is a very common, which is the means justify the end. Um, so there are actually many different types of these rationalizations that stop people from acting on it. But the question is, why is it that some people don't use those rationalizations? And, or at certain point they say, I'm just, you know, telling big lies to myself. I know this doesn't feel good. So that whole question is what gives people courage? And that's a whole different set of thing. And that's why, you know, what does the Bible call us to do? And when God says he expects us to do it, how does he help us? Is this just a battle for me and me alone? Do I carry this whole sort of battle against people doing wrong things? Or where do I believe God comes into the picture and you know, and the Holy Spirit? Another thing is understanding the cost of doing wrong things. Why is truth telling important? Because a lot of times there is no cost for lying. This is a victimless crime. But I think, again, uh, going back to understanding if it's really victimless, what is the cause of this? And what does the Bible tell us to do? When Jesus said, there's no need to take vows. If you mean yes, say yes. If you mean no, say no. Anything other than that um, is a sin. So you have to go back to, are there things that matter to you? And where does God fit into the picture? Because if you think that this is only me against the empire, well, you know, a lot of them say, let me pass on this. So faith is very important. Spiritual reflection is very important. And I think sometimes, too, uh, is to recognize the sacredness of the person, that we are not just, you know, these things or these sort of, we're not just left to our own device to just make a living at all costs, that in the end there is a sacredness and a holiness in us that might help us stop going to the lowest version of ourselves. So there's actually a lot of formation that can be done in wanting to do the right things and having the courage to do the right things. And how much does this come down to a cultural thing, like the culture of the business and creating a better culture that encourages virtue within its employees? Um, Actually, culture is very important. You know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of study that shows that there's a lot of cheating in our culture, uh, cheating on exams, cheating on lab reports, cheating on resumes, uh, you know, 
those types of things. But at the same time, we can't just assign it to culture because we know at the same time, there's a lot of effort on the part of parents and teachers and so on, which try to go on the other side. I think in the end, there are culture of fear and anxiety. Hmm. Um, there's plenty of students who said that it's doing the right thing very important, and they said yes. But then when they asked um, why would they not do the right thing, they say their parents, that their parents would rather see them succeed than be honest. And so, you know, there's a lot of mixed messages. It's not that we don't care. It's that I think fear and anxiety plays a very important role. And in the end, religion is anti-culture. And sometimes I also don't think that that's fair. I think things are not binary. It's not either good or bad. It's a whole mix. It's a whole range. And sometimes you lean more towards one versus the other, depending on how you feel, how vulnerable you are, and how strong your formation is. So I think this desire, this this emphasis on doing the right things, if we hear enough from the communities that matter to us, if we see it in action, it's more real. Kyle, and I think that's the whole formation. I mean, formation is only possible. <laughs> if you believe that people could be the better version of themselves. Yeah. Like, and the role of not just teaching, it's not like these are 10 principles to be good, but if you're raised in a community where they really value it and they really practice it. As I say, for example, you don't learn generosity because you read about it. You learn about generosity because other people have been generous to you and you have seen other people in action with others. Hmm. But you have to experience it. You have to be on the receiving side of generosity. And you have also to see it in action by other people to other people. And then that becomes real. How much of this should be coming from the top down within a business versus could you have a movement that starts with, I'll use it in quotes, like a lowly employee but and, and kind of work from the bottom up to change the culture of a, of a business? We need both. Okay. So, you know, in the old days, we say if the leaders is not genuine um, and authentic in acting on these principles, everything is lost. But it is no longer true because now, you know, in 2020, we are seeing young people very empowered. Think about a number of these uh, movements that were started because employees say, we don't want our companies selling technology to do bad things. Or, you know, there's whistleblowers, protection now, very strong protection actually. And I think social media has opened up a whole sort of channel for people to band together and say, you know, there's this behavior happening and we're not happy about it. And particularly for consumer products, they're very concerned about their reputation. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd be the first one to say there's also exploitation of these things. So now anybody could say anything, and it's hard to disprove it. But when used right, I think now bottom-up is also a very viable strategy. All right. Well, there's so much more to talk about. People will have to come to the lecture. Again, the topic is business as a force for good. And that's going to be Tuesday, February 25th, Fat Tuesday, 7 a.m., uh, breakfast included. You can find information if you go to sf.edu and search for Service Omnium. And it starts at 7 a.m. and goes till about 8.45. So people can check that out. You can get tickets in advance or at the door. And I'm really looking forward to your lecture. Dr. Carolyn Wu, thanks for joining us today and sharing a little bit with us. Thank you, Kyle. God bless.